Welcome to Film Creatives Voices. We're your hosts. I am Arlene Della Pena. And I'm Walter Talents. And today we are going to be talking about documentaries. Ooh, tell me more why. Yeah. We have an amazing guest today. I every time I think about her, I feel like I know her through uh, her her award winning Emmy award winning documentary. Matt Shepard is a friend of mine. I just I want to like tear up already. I'm sorry. Wow, that's <laughs> it's, intense. It, it's so it was so powerful. I remember watching the footage on the news, um, you know, that in the late '90s yeah, and that, the story. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it made national headlines in, for such a small town in Wyoming, and to see the documentary and really get to know, um, you know, Matt Shepard, his family, mm-hmm. uh, and Michelle and her perspective of everything that had happened. It's just heart wrenching, and it's beautiful and lovely and. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to her. Well, what's amazing, too, is just, I mean, documentary filmmaking is a craft, and it's a difficult process. And you have a lot of experience doing that. I have a few, yeah. I mean, uh, being a combat cameraman, we did do a few documentaries, but not nothing feature-length like the one she did, but it's like we do small little documentary short narratives. Um, And I've done some, you know, during college and post-college, but documentary filmmaking is so difficult. It's just... Aside from just getting B-roll footage and getting interviews and convincing people to talk to them, and Mm -hmm. for the most part, I believe it's like free because it's like you don't want to influence people by paying them off or anything like that. So it's like just really good news gathering in a sense, and then just getting good B-roll footage and like just having a good narrative, a script as your telling the story. It's so difficult. And I think the fascinating part about documentaries is that you know. A lot of times, like it seems like it's going to start off one way, mm-hmm. and the story is really this. And then the more uh, footage that you get and the more information, it's like a whole new story develops on its own, and you get to know so many intimate details about, um, you know, the people, the subject, and what the message is. And so I think it's it's amazing. I've I've never uh, done a documentary. Kudos to the people who do it. Mm-hmm. It's so much work, and um, you know, you can tell when somebody's heart and soul and their life is put so much into it. So I, th- I think it's great. Yeah, and it's, it's just sometimes, depending on the documentary, you know, you could put your life on the line for it uh, or and or you get to get real close with the people you cover and their families because some documentaries just start, it's just intense because they get to know you. And even with uh, her, Michelle's documentary, right? She, she gets to speak to the family and... Mm-hmm. Uh, and the people that was involved in the case and it's just crazy and then one thing I gotta say about documentarians is just how they uh, what I want to ask her is how she keeps track of all her footage because right I mean aside from her and other people she's got it like Michael Moore and all those guys like it's got to be thousands of hours of footage and how do you keep track of that you know logging it and right just, <laughs> it's crazy it blows my mind like um and speaking of what you were talking about, like you start one way and then you end in a different footnote. I did a documentary about uh, Iraqi war refugees uh, post film school. And yeah, it was amazing. It was like I learned about like the immigration system in Sweden and all that stuff. And then it just a twist and turn and like how the, even some immigrants were kind of looking down at these new immigrants coming in from, you know, Iraq just because they're trying to get out of their situation but the like earlier 1980s 1990s uh immigrants in sweden were like kind of being like anti-immigrant in a sense it was a it was uh which is so different it was different yeah yeah yeah. i I did not expect that you know so i'm really curious to see um to hear from michelle like what how she started her process and how Mm. it ended and just even just the technical aspects of her documentary and for it to be very very personal yeah just uh, hang hang tight we're gonna have a few words from our sponsors and you guys are watching phil am creatives voices today's episode brought to you by the good folks at filipino worker center from the heart of historic filipino town pwc focuses on providing programs that help meet the immediate needs of workers and their families while at the same time building their leadership to take collective action for long-lasting change. Hi-Fi Kitchen is a casual takeout delivery cafe in LA's historic Filipino town. 
They specialize in traditional and vegan Filipino fare, using a modern approach to share the comfort of their family recipes. In celebration of these beloved dishes, their mission is to provide accessibility and visibility to not only the cuisine, but to Hi-Fi, historic Filipino town's affectionate name. And welcome back to Film Creative Voices. And we have Michelle with us. And we are going to talk about a very, very moving documentary that you did about your friend. Actually, Matt Shepard is a friend of mine. And so how are you doing this morning? We're so excited you're here. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I live two minutes up the street in oh, Angelino you Heights. I, sh- I could have just walked. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I pulled in the garage and there's like a jeepney in the parking yeah. lot. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> there's donuts in the green room. Like, yeah, I couldn't be happier. So Have you been here before to PWC? No, sadly no. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, welcome then. Yes, Thank yes. You. Thank you. So, Matt Shepard. Oh, my goodness. I know that this is a very um, personal story for you. And so can you, can you tell us and our audience a little bit more about uh, the documentary? Sure. Um, I mean, it has roots all the way back to high school, really. So it goes back, um, gosh, I'm 40 years old. So like back to when I was like 15, 16 years old. Um, My mom, she grew up in the Philippines and then got recruited to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. um, And she moved to D.C. in her early 20s and worked there, worked really hard. um, And she found out that that company has this benefit for their employees to send their children abroad. So I, and through that, ended up going to a boarding school in Switzerland. Mm. It's wild, but you know, that's how it happened, an international boarding school. And that's where I met Matthew Shepard, but we just called him Matt. Um, and we became really good friends, primarily through theater, because he was two years older than me. We didn't have classes together. Um, so we we met and interacted through plays. And I was, you know, your typical, like, theater nerd. And so was he. And we just got really, really close. Um, and then he graduated. We lost touch. This was pre-social media and all that. Um, you know, heard from him sporadically. But then the next time I really heard about him was in 1998 when I was in film school and I got a phone call from my sister and she said, you know, pick, um, I turn on the news, um, your friend Matt's all over the news, something terrible happened to him. And it just took me a while to like put all these pieces together because it was literally on CNN, on the ticker tape, on every news channel. Um, A young man was tortured and beaten basically almost to death um, and tied to a fence in a remote prairie in Laramie, Wyoming. I knew that was Matt. I knew he had gone back to Wyoming to go to university. Um, and I just stayed riveted like the whole rest of the world. Um, you know, he, he was in a coma for five days and then finally succumbed to his, to his injuries and, and passed away. Um, in the course of that, that, his story just took on sort of these epic proportions it was just like such a sensational story the way it was covered was was um really intense so it was kind of hard to reconcile losing someone so close to me with it being like everywhere all over the news and magazines um you know but as I mentioned I was going to film school at the time and I guess like Making films, writing films is kind of something that I leaned on pretty heavily. And I knew then that probably the right thing to do as his friend would be to honor him in, you know, in a play or in a film. Um, but just, I guess, because the grief was so intense, it took too, very a long time to be able to feel like I could do that in a competent way. Right. Yeah. And then um, I think it took almost over a decade for me to feel like I could do that. So then I set out to make the documentary way back <laughs> so long ago now, but in 2010. Um, and we filmed all over the world, just retracing his steps. The primary goal of the film was just to recapture Matt and show who he was to the world as a human being and not just this terrible thing that happened to him. And also, like, not as just this gay rights martyr who was perfect because he wasn't. Um, I just felt like that was the best thing I could do for him and for his family and his legacy. Um, Yeah, and then here we are. Like, the film was incredibly difficult to make. We did it on our own terms without any industry backing. That was my first feature film. 
we raised it, raised all the money through Kickstarter, just people all around the world willing it to happen to fruition because, you know, I'm not rich. Documentarians aren't rich. Um, people all over the world cared enough to hear this story in, in the way that I wanted to tell it. Um, so then we just kept going and then I was on the festival circuit with the film for two solid years. How long did it take you to, from start to finish, to make it, get everything, edit, and it's ready? Honestly, like almost three years. Yeah, wow. yeah. documentaries take forever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you can churn it out, but me, I just, you know, I'm not that quick, and you know, most of my projects tend to be deeply personal, and you know, I like really throwing out a wide net of footage and really getting getting through it and digging deeper. So anyway, it took a really long time. And for a, such as, because it was a pretty successful, it was a pretty successful documentary, right? Yes, yes. What kind, how many awards has it won so far? Um, I, <laughs> Humble brag. Yeah, at <laughs> least, I think at least 10 audience awards um, in film, th with film festivals around the world. Um, and then we won the Emmy. Um, in 2015 uh, for our being um, with our broadcast version of the film with Logo TV. It was their inaugural um, documentary series for the oh, channel. Wow. Um, so that was really exciting. And I was actually with my family in Cebu, Philippines in a hotel like at six in the morning. I like got a phone call and I was like, oh my gosh, you got nominated for the Emmy. And this was five years after we started making the film. Wow. So it was a long journey. You know, um, but yeah, that's kind of what ended up that's happening awesome. with the film. Now, for the people who wants to get into documentary filmmaking and to get awards and have the quality that you was, were able to produce, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering and asking, like, and you mentioned it, like, how how is the funding and, like, how hard is it to raise money for documentaries? And how, what maybe give some tips to people? Yeah, future. I'll try. I mean, that's a really tough question. You know, I'm... I said earlier, like, you don't go into documentaries to be rich. Mm -hmm. That's just the, the honest truth. I mean, uh, you can, and especially the way the, the content is shifting so much. Like, people are, mm -hmm. there is that appetite for documentaries, but not necessarily, like, back then. Um, but my advice would be, I mean, you don't really need permission to tell your story. You can make a documentary on your iPhone if you wanted to. And people have made really successful feature films and docs using, like, the thing in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can be creative and you could be out of the box. Um, you know, we found a lot of funding through Kickstarter. And it was back then, it was just when it was starting. But now there's, like, Seed and Spark and Indiegogo. Like, there are ways. It's really about not giving up and being tenacious about what you want to do. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer in, you know, there's a, if there's a will, there's a way. Did you get any pushback when you were trying to, uh, you know, do Kickstarters and uh, just backing up for this project? Not at all. You know, it was, it was a strategic choice. You know, I, I really was passionate about telling Matt's story in a certain way. I wanted it to be personal, empathic, to really tell, to show who he was in the way he, he, I felt he deserved, like his story deserved to be told. So I didn't really, I wanted to retain a large amount of creative control. Mm -hmm. So I thought that if I could fund it myself or find people who would believe in what I wanted to do, um, that I could do so. So that's why I chose, I found out about Kickstarter and I chose to do it that way. I could have probably sought out financiers and done it that way, but I just didn't want to give up that. Wow. So no vision. corporate sponsors or grants or anything like that at no. all. It's purely like contributions from the community and, uh, Wow, that's Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. It's the thing I'm most proud of with the project. Like when the film's over and then you see the credits roll mm -hmm. and roll and roll, it's all the names of our, mostly all the names of our Kickstarter backers who made it happen. And like our crew, there's like, sometimes it was just me and my cameraman. And then it was the rest of the credits is just like people donated like a dollar to a thousand dollars to make it happen. What about, you know, interviewing family and friends and other people who knew Matt? Were they hesitant at first? Were they welcoming this project with open arms? Because I'm sure that, you know, it it deeply impacted them, especially, I mean, his parents seemed like such lovely people and so forgiving and open. Um, and, you know, even like uh, watching the other classmates of your guys's, you know, um, from high school, 
did they seem open or apprehensive or fearful or you know, how did they react when you approach them? If it makes sense, um, they were both mm-hmm. open and apprehensive. Um, you know, after Matt died, we were we were all together for his funeral. And then after that, I don't really remember a time we were all like together and together collectively honoring Matt and remembering him. So this, in the course of making this film, that was the first time we had the opportunity to do so. And that was beyond scary. Mm -hmm. So scary. Um, So when Matt, the first person I approached was was Judy Shepard, Matt's mom, just to get her blessing. Um, She knew this was some, a project I've always wanted to do. And I believe the thing she said was, it's about time. You know, and then after that, I just felt like, okay, I have, I have a blessing. I can do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went went back and contacted other people I felt would be representative of um, Matt's story through the various parts of his life, like high school years, college years, people who were the cl- who were closest to him, mm-hmm. um, and all of them, you know, knew that it was the right thing to do. But I think we're, again, really apprehensive and hesitant to open up those wounds again. I mean, you know, I, I always cry when I talk about him and that ha- he died 20 years ago. Like that doesn't, that type of grief doesn't really go away ever. Um, it's just something that we knew we had to do and we wanted to do it together. I'm like already getting emotional. <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah, because even, you know, um, Y'all have to watch it. Oh my gosh, it's so, so incredibly moving. Um, even at the end with, um, when you're talking to the priest, who, so there was a priest who was talking to um, the the accused men who had murdered, um, um, you know, and, and caused so much conflict with, not conflict, but it, I don't even want to say it. <laughs> like, they, they, they killed him, you know? And so um, when you ask the question about, do they have good in their hearts? asking the priest if he felt that way. And I think the most surprising aspect for me, I, like I knew I knew that it was such a charged, emotionally charged question for you to ask personally. And then to see your reaction, you know, like oh, I was like so right there with you. And um, how, did you find like these moments cathartic? Did you find it that it was just, you know, reliving these moments all over again? Like how was it for you going through that process? <sighs> Um, during the filming, you know, because we're such a small crew with no money and we're just like a ragtag team, just kind of flying around the country trying to get it hap- getting it to happen, um, a lot of it was just me running on adrenaline. I'm like, okay, I, I want to talk about childhood. I want to talk to this person. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, I'm an editor as well. So, you know, I'm directing, but also like editing at the same time. Yeah. My brain's going like, you know, a thousand miles an hour. Um, but the, the interview that you're talking about in particular, it was transformative for me, and it still is, because it was so difficult. I speak to Father Roger Schmidt, who was um, the university priest at the time of Matt's death, and who also advocated for his killers to not get the death penalty. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to him because I was angry, and I felt like I couldn't talk. I, I didn't want to go and talk to these killers, so that was almost like the closest I, I was willing to go, you know, mm-hmm. towards that part of the story. And that was the, of all the interviews I had done, that was the one where I kind of took off my director's and editor's hat and I was just engaging with him as me, as Michelle, as, you know, so, sorry. It's okay. Can we fly in a tissue? <laughs> I'm sorry, Ronnie. Or Meredith. I do this every time I talk about this part of the film, but I was just like angry and so my cameraman was really uncomfortable and you see in the movie like the camera goes all wonky Mm -hmm. and he's like should I keep rolling but he keeps on rolling thankfully and I just kind of have this really human conversation with him and he teaches me like a very important lesson thank you um that it's it's okay to be mad Mm -hmm. and I take that like every anniversary of his death I I remember that sorry Okay. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, um, Father Roger, right, he he really said it best because as, as somebody, as the audience watching the documentary, I, I really felt like, I felt the pain, I felt the anger, and I, 
I was really hoping he would, like, I knew what he was going to say. I knew what his answer, because, you know, he's a priest. Yeah. I knew what he was going to say. And I was just like, don't say it. Just don't say it. And then he said it. And, you know, he, he said it in such a calming way and empathetic way, I felt, you know. And, and, um, and I, was, I, was, I was so angry that all of this was happening. And I, I was trying to put myself in the parents' shoes and the people who were advocating for to avoid the death penalty. Because I know if it was, you know, my son or a family member or a friend, I, I don't know if I could say let them live and, and be at peace with that, you know. And I'm sure many of you, you know, who really knew him felt that same way. And I, I think that for the parents, for his, his mom and dad and other people to advocate for for the killers, it, it's remarkable. I mean, it shows so much compassion and forgiveness and, and um, you know, understanding that I, I hope that I can find that <laughs> like deep within me to feel that way if I'm ever in that situation. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was, it, was, it was so well said that when he said, it's okay to be angry and I hope you stay angry, you know, and, and not to like be filled with hate or things like that, but that it's okay to, there's like, um, there's, you know, tears, these types of tears are okay. You know, like, the, yeah, how, they're how am earned. I saying? I'm like too emotional. Well, like, <laughs> like, yeah, it's okay to be cry. angry. <laughs> it's okay to be angry. Just don't let it be, cons- just don't be consumed, consumed by right. it. Yeah, right. and I think that's the ultimate takeaway or what I wish um, the takeaway for the film and the story to be is, you know, anger is can be righteous and um, it, it has ability to be very powerful and transformative. And, you know, we all, all of us have a choice to channel that and transform it and use it for, for good, you know, spread compassionate understanding within like your own communities and that ripples outward. And hopefully all together we can create a different type of world where mm-hmm. these types of things don't happen so that was the lesson that he gave me that I hope the film and Matt and his family you know keep spreading to others now I, I just want to ask you like when you were planning your production doing pre-production work for this like how did you did you write your script and have an idea on your storyline or you kind of just wing it as you go along <laughs> or is based on the travel itinerary like how did you, in the three years of production, yeah, how did you, like, what was your benchmarks and how did you, like, do the story turning points or whatnot? Yeah, I mean, a little bit of both. Like, you know, with documentary, especially with, like, verite work, I mean, this one was different because we were talking about things that happened in the past. Um, you, you know, you have to do a lot of planning, but you have to be really flexible and nimble and and. Because you're basing it on your sometimes the interview schedule too. Oh right? my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I we I didn't write a script. Um, I I just knew that um, the main trajectory of the narrative should just follow Matt Matt's life is his 21 years from childhood in Wyoming to Switzerland to Wyoming and then the murder and the aftermath. So we I just just selected people who could be champions and um and narrators for those chapters in his life and and speak to them and then you know a lot of my documentary works work is really um I really base it on the the interview and the conversations that I have with with my subjects I try not to over prepare Mm -hmm. um I think that's what's so thrilling about my particular genre um people will just tell you really surprising things it's real life um and that's what I want to empower and and um, and showcase. So, like, I try not – basically, in short, I try not to overly plan. So you kind of had a basic structure, basic like you're saying. Basic structure. But then after you started collecting all the footage, that's when it started solidifying. And then maybe you did your voiceover or even, like – Yeah. I mean, yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Well, what did you learn? Because, you know, you knew him in high school. And what were the surprising things that you learned – about yourself or even Matt with the with the trajectory of the story that you wanted to go I you know I, I did mention earlier that we had fell fallen out of touch um, you know and that's something I feel guilty about even you know now all these years later you know people drift apart but for some reason I was like oh I wish we had stayed you know stayed in touch and maybe I could have been a better support for him so the surprising thing I learned was how 
how depressed he was, how hard things had gotten for him after high school, how much he struggled with, you know, his issues of identity and sexuality. Um, those that was heartbreaking to learn. You know, we in the in the film you see that we. Um, open up his box of belongings and read his letters and postcards and diary entries. We were really getting like a deep look into the things that he was thinking. So, you know, that was what I learned. And, you know, it also was bittersweet. And I mean, how helpful was finding things like that, like his diary and, um, you know, because that's something that most people don't do. I don't think even like, yeah. aside from our Facebook, it's almost like our diary now, like, how helpful was that? And if that if it wasn't there, how much more difficult do you think your documentary would have been? Yeah, I mean, that's incredibly insightful. It's just, on the one hand, it's about Matt, but it's also about a historic document about that time. Like, the 90s, was a, it was a different time. You didn't mm -hmm. see, like, that much LGBT representation on screen or on TV. We didn't have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to, like, instantaneously document our thoughts and feelings so you know to be he, that to have like these papers um with his his innermost thoughts that was just such a treasure trove and i don't think it would have happened if we were making it about someone who was living today and i i often feel that that was a real blessing because you know matt was robbed of his voice but through his letters and reading his own words, we were allow, allowing him the opportunity to narrate his own story. Nice. So for you folks, start going back and doing your diaries or <laughs> journals for that matter. I have a Hello Kitty journal that I still <laughs> That's write cute. in. <laughs> now, That's I kind of so want to talk about um, going into that now you're editing. Like how... My favorite thing to ask is like, how do you organize your <laughs> footage? Right, because I'm sure you have tons and tons and tons. Like how many hours of footage and how did you organize this? Yeah, I'm sure we had at least like 100 hours of footage um, and just a myriad of stuff like B-roll, like you were saying in the intro and tons of hours of interviews. Yeah, I mean, there's no shortcut around that stuff. But you do have to go through it all, and you have to be organized. Otherwise, it just becomes this paralyzing mess. Um, so I would organize it. I mean, if you want to go in the minutia, like I'll organizing it, it, organize it in bins, you know, like all the interviews. And then <laughs> yeah. within the interviews, like all the different topics, and just get familiar with it. And then B-roll, I'm like, okay, Wyoming B-roll here, and all that stuff. But, just um, Marie Kondo, those... Uh, <laughs> you <laughs> have to. to. You like, have I'm just like to. thinking about it I'm like I can't I can't even look at that like I would feel so overwhelmed see it's, this is why I don't yeah. edit <laughs> like, like, it's overwhelming it. but it's, yeah. it's um if I didn't edit I would feel like I was robbed of like a huge part of the the making of of the film especially in documentary like that's where the film really happens, happens is in the edit so it's just like a necessary evil, but I've come to really just love it. Like the things that you can do, like with words and picture and and music. I often cut to music and get inspired by music, and it'll kind of unleash something in my understanding of the material that I necessarily didn't I didn't necessarily know initially. Like it's just a, such an exciting thing. With the success of your documentary, I, I was just kind of curious, like what has been the reaction to it? What you know, aside from you got awards, but for the from the public, from the families, or even from the LGBTQ community, what's it been like? What's their reaction towards you and your film? Um, it's well, it's a long. That's a big question. Um, Matt's story is is enormous, and is one with. I mean, he has a tremendous legacy. His family started a foundation, um, you know, to highlight the importance of standing up for the LGBT community just by sharing a story. There's been plays and other films and artwork, um, but in just speaking about our film, what I found was um, really wonderful was seeing how the film was being brought to younger generations who grew up and just not knowing about Matthew Shepard and what happened to him. So I think our film did a really good job of connecting um, younger people with Matt and also um, ha reconnecting a story to people who vaguely remembered it um, and just by the fact that we were humanizing him in this different way 
allowing them to reflect on the real human, the depth of the tragedy and taking that back with them. Um, I've had the opportunity to share the film around the world, um, Taiwan and Russia, which is, you know, not a great place to be for yeah. if you're LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And bringing it to them, I, I've seen changes, you know, um, and the shepherds, um, his parents have traveled with me quite a bit um, with the film, sharing their story, and it's, and it's powerful. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with the U.S. Department of State under a different president and a different administration, um, again, sharing the film. Um, and we also have an educational version of the film for the sole purpose of younger people learning about, about Matt. Um, so it, it keeps on going. Like, we hope this film is evergreen, and we hope people keep rediscovering it and then passing it along to people who need to know about it. Um, I've been in communities that aren't necessarily, like, the most tolerant. Like, I went to Indiana and, and presented it at, a, at an art museum there, and people were wanting to, they were, they were wanting to see the film and wanting that platform within their community to discuss the fact that they were not okay with what was happening with the hate and vitriol that keeps bubbling up um, in today's culture. So um, I don't know, a little little things and big things, I would say. Wow, I mean, that's it's great that it's it's like a it's a time capsule, right? That it's you're able to share it and um, and a universal theme. I feel um, because I, I think the the sense of family and community and keeping in touch, you know, because of like how you're talking about, um, you know, it had been years and you had wished you kept in touch. Like that's what I kept thinking about because I've, I've also lived, you know, around the world in different states and, and all that. And I, I mean, thank God for social media, you yeah. know, it's made it a lot easier. I know a lot of people who don't want social media, media, they don't want to be mm -hmm. on Facebook because of <laughs> whatever they think, like the, the Russians are spying on us or whatever, <laughs> whatever the case is. Right. Um, but I feel like it's such a huge asset because it is our own story and our own timeline of of what's been happening and what's been going on. And it made me want to reach out more to other people. And with veterans, I mean, we like, you know, there's always like a, a radio check with within uh, the veteran community and the military community where, hey, just checking up on you and you just do like a blast email or blast message out to everybody and everybody responds. And, and I feel like um, there has been a huge cultural shift because you know, tragic things happen and you never know people's struggles and yeah. they can yeah. appear completely happy on the outside. And then on the inside, you know, they're, it's the opposite. And who knew, you know, who really knew? Yeah. So. And I think, yeah, that's the amazing part about social, social media today, right? Like, I, I, I realize I see people in person, like, that I haven't seen in, I don't know, five years, but it feels like... Like you know them. We know them, um, or like we're, because we're up to date, we see their status and, us, and stuff like that. And, but I do have friends, like you say, like, you know, I was close to and you just drift apart. And then when you see them again, it's like you left off, for, you, you started back from where you left off. Absolutely. But sometimes we, we do re have those regrets of like, oh, wow, I, I should have done better and staying in touch and this and why that why don't you call right? me more huh <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> i'm too busy surfing <laughs> that's true yeah. that's true you know hawaii life <laughs> yeah well and i just kind of want to bring it back to uh to you as a filmmaker um you know you were you were in theater in high school mm -hmm. you were a theater geek <laughs> nah, is it a theater geek kid i don't know whatever but what plays did you do when you were in high school oh my gosh um, have you ever seen the movie Rushmore? Do you remember yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought that I was like Max, you know, writing these, like, I wrote plays, short plays. Mm. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm just like, you know, Max taking myself, like, taking my craft, like, very seriously and, you know, casting my friends in them. Um, but, yeah, I was in, like, a lot of Shakespeare plays we did in our high school, like Midsummer Night's Dream. I remember that was, like, a big moment for me. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, uh, I a checkoff play that was a play that Matt and I were in. He was my brother. And then um, like some, what about Grease? I was Frenchy and I oh, wore nice. like a, a pink wig. You know, just like a ton. We did like three three plays every every high, every high school year. Because I was about to ask you, did you walk around with a beret? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Sis, sis, did she have a beret? 
<laughs> I think that was a maybe. <laughs> I saw a maybe out there. <laughs> um, and yeah, so like, how did your creative upbringing, you know, w- you led you to just filmmaking? Like, how do you feel like it? Like, did your parents approve? <laughs> like, that's what I wanted. I don't think they didn't approve. You know, they've always been really supportive, but kind of like not totally understanding what I wanted to do. I know for a while when I was at Emerson studying film, my mom would always say that I was a journal journalist or studying <laughs> journalism. That's, that's, that's like, what she told her friends. Yeah, I was like, that's not... <laughs> You're just yeah. hella cracking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not, like, really what I was doing, but... What was your major in university? It was film. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's journalist here, mom. Yeah, I'm like, okay. <laughs> Dang, well, mom. So, like, <laughs> at what point did you decide that you wanted to do documentaries, you know? And well, I always, as a little girl, wanted to do something with, um, you know, television or film. Always. I just knew right away, like, that's what I wanted to do. We were, we, my sister's in the, <laughs> in the audience, and we would put on plays in our garage and skits and all this stuff. Um, so that has never changed. And then in um, at Tassis at my boarding school, like, I did plays. And then after that, I, wa- I was like, why stop there? I want to write. I want to do all of it you know there's just so much more so I kind of gravitated towards like the writing and the directing and stopped Mm -hmm. being like up front and on stage I just thought I was better suited to do the other stuff and then I went into film school um and then I didn't take documentary courses like back in the 90s like the cool stuff was like Tarantino films like Mm -hmm. I remember watching Pulp Fiction it just blowing my mind and how like written it is and it's how like the dialogues Mm -hmm. super snappy and witty and I was like I want to make films like that but I'm like that's not really who I am though um so randomly um one summer in college I got um asked to go back to my boarding school to make a short documentary film on the founder of that school and she was just this very charismatic like queen like lady who lived a very interesting full life um so it didn't need to be written like it was already there and just from that little project it sparked in me a desire to wanting to move into documentary and help document real things real life stories and I just found that I was good at it because um I think I'm a good listener and I think that's like the main thing you need to be when you're a documentarian is is just be open and mm-hmm. be a really good listener. And I was like, I, I can do that, and I love it. So, Would you say you're a very organized person? Too? No, not at all. Not at really? all. Not at all. Wow. I think with all that footage. Yeah, I would think you're a very organized, yeah. and meticulous person. No. I could be – I have an assistant editor now who's so amazing, and he would be the first person <laughs> to be all, like, she's, she's all my mess. assistant is very <laughs> 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 Shout hey, it takes assistant. a team, right? <laughs> yeah, it takes a team. It really does, especially when your projects get like bigger. You know, like then it starts getting unwieldy, and you need to involve more people and have like a bigger team to help you out. Like in the beginning, back when I was making those types of films, I was like, I could do it all. It's fine. I don't. I have that like '90s that DIY kind of like punk attitude. Like I, I could just do it and make it happen. But you know, things start. You get older and things progress, and you can't do it like that anymore. <laughs> What advice do you have for people who want to do their very first documentary? Other than, you know, being a very good listener, what what would be your best advice for people to go ahead and just do it? Like tips to along the way. Hmm. That's yeah, that's a toughie. I think um uh like I said before, I think a big thing that kind of hinders people is just maybe an inner voice that says like you can't or you shouldn't um and I try to squash that whenever possible like I my advice is just you don't really need advice from me you don't need to wait around for permission to make your story just do it and we're luckily we're at at a time in our technological culture where you can do that so be tenacious don't ask for permission find a project that you're really passionate about because if you're not I mean you that just, would be very difficult yeah, <laughs> it, would, it would it would take forever to get done <laughs> yeah I think so yeah and I mean um how did you find your crew just a little shed spotlight on your cr- crew for that like how did you find them and how did you guys um 
what was the chemistry like just traveling together for three years or working <laughs> it's together? It's really intense. <laughs> um, so I, um, my partner used my cameraman and we just worked together really, really well and we traveled together really well. Um, so you have to have a certain kind of chemistry and you have to like, like that or my team we all like that kind of chaos Mm -hmm. and we don't get like overly stressed by like flights being changed and this guy changed his um, interview time and now we have to meet him here and drive across you know the city like you have to have that kind of vibe like not a lot of people are suited to that you know i think we're kind of like crazy a little bit you know you guys sound like a band yeah <laughs> like <laughs> going on tour right yeah you, you guys just found each other th- in, through the university or through professional um, connections a lot of my lifelong friends and collaborator co- collaborators i met at tastis mm-hmm. um just because we all were so close and kind of had like similar interests so my cameraman i met him um through his sister we went to high school together um, you know, friend of a friend, that type of thing. And then when you find like your collaborators, like you, I hold on to them, you know, because it really, like you said, it takes a team, it takes a village. I like to think of them as, you know, my family. So, mm-hmm. what's it like to be a Filipino American filmmaker? Oh my gosh. And, I wanna, yeah. yeah. Or, and or documentarian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, we don't see. I mean, too many. Right, right. I mean, you you're a rare gem, and so what's Thank it you. what's <laughs> it what's it like for you? Um, you know, telling stories that uh, well, this one particularly. I mean, like, it's, yes, he's a very close friend, but from your perspective and um, and your background and everything going hmm. with the story. Uh, I wear my heart on my sleeve, so I guess I'll just be very real here. It's both a beautiful thing and it's a very incredibly hard thing. You know, like you said, there's not many people in my field who look like me, um, who are small or brown or female, you know. So somehow, I don't know if I kind of internalize that, like culturally speaking, like growing up, like feeling somehow... Maybe that's why I'm so, like, competitive and passionate. Just, like, I'm trying to overcompensate for that inner voice, like that little girl who's, like, not good enough or white enough or, you know, normal enough and that I want to shut that voice down. So, like, I will say that I feel like it's harder. Like, if I'm invited to the table, like, I have to just be that much more prepared, Mm -hmm. you know, work that much harder. And, you know, I do. So... I, I do think it's hard, um, but at the same time, I recognize that it's a beautiful part about who I am and, and how I tell my stories. Like, I am special, you know, like we all are, but, you know, that w- that's what makes me special, and that's what makes my stories and my voice different, and that's why, uh, you know, I'm here and telling the stories that I want to tell. Nice. And uh, speaking of which, do you, th- do you feel like the fact that you're petite, brown, you know, Filipino woman makes people more comfortable talking to you like could you could you see it as an advantage when you do interviews in your documentaries I think so yeah I think I yeah I do think so like people feel comfortable talking to me I'm not very I guess like intimidating you know um so they feel like that there's some sort of like ease there mm-hmm. and then a lot of that do- you know documentary interview work is about like that chemistry the that rapport. the rapport so you know i definitely i mean my films would be totally different if i didn't have that kind of rapport so yeah i guess i guess yeah that's a good point point. A- and i will say the your film i i feel like i can see the the filipino background that's in in the way you tell the story and it um you know the lightheartedness and the honesty and and you can tell it was it was done so delicately and respectfully and I feel like you know with with other um filmmakers that do documentaries you don't always see that you know sometimes it's like really harsh up front and 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 it's like that that same loving sense from the Filipino culture is is there throughout the entire film and so so to me it's like to see if I didn't see you in the film you know I felt like there was a lot of same values that Filipino Americans could definitely uh, identify with and so I think that is 
for sure like highlighted. Oh my gosh, thank you. I've never heard that before, but that really touches my heart. You know, on Matt's from the Midwest, I feel like I have like a kinship to people in the Midwest mm-hmm. or Filipinos might have that be just because it's all about like that ease and that community and, and being open hearted and yeah. And even even the way you talk, when you the way you would interview people, it's it's so loving the way a Filipino mother would love their own children. Aww. You know, it's very, very sweet. Oh, thank yeah. you. I want to cry now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's I too have emotional to our people. <laughs> yeah, which is fantastic because I think, you know, showcasing the true essence of humans and and being kind and, and showing those raw emotions is mm-hmm. what makes your film so desirable and so easy to watch and and um, no matter how difficult the subject may be. So yeah, kudos to you. Keep oh, making thanks. more. Yeah. <laughs> so so you're basically saying Filipinos should just move to the Midwest and to <laughs> <laughs> just like You know, earlier when you were asking me the questions, I was about, you know, being being brown, petite and all that. I thought you were about to start rapping, dude. <laughs> I was, like, was I flowing? Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Check, check, one, two. Uh, uh. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, like, oh, and going into, like, ap- so after, now that you're an Emmy-winning, you know, filmmaker, how do you choose Wait, your... Wait, can you say that again? <laughs> now that you are an Emmy-winning <laughs> filmmaker... Yay! Uh... How do you choose your projects, or how, do, how how has projects been coming to you? Like projects don't <laughs> don't y'all send ha- her projects <laughs> <laughs> don't or haven't come to me. I'm or how know, do you find it? I, yeah. yeah, I'm making a project now that I'm not a, a full like I'm not able to talk about. In Expose. Public. She will talk about it now. <laughs> I'll tell you later <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But um, it's one that I'm very passionate about that I was. That was always on the back burner while I was making the the Matt Shepard um, mm-hmm. film, um, so it's just been a little easier in terms of like getting financing and people um, saying, "Oh, she has something under her belt," you know that type when of thing. And they're like, "Why should we invest in your film?" You're like, <laughs> "Boom! <laughs> this is why." <laughs> One day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean. As you're working or just on your during your everyday life, are you like just constantly reading, digesting things, and thinking like, oh, that might be interesting, or like, what catches your eye? Um, yeah, I'm not at that point yet, just because I'm so steeped in my current project. We're um, finishing the edit right now, so that I dream the footage. <laughs> That's like where I'm at right now, but I do see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I know, Ooh. yeah, usually like at that point like that creative part of the the process like I I try to go to like music shows go to museums like even watching tv like a random commercial will spark something in me like so I try to like stay open and and see like what will inspire me oh man looking (laughs) forward uh, how can people find you on social media find your work it's very easy to find me (laughs) you guys found me um (laughs) I'm on Instagram, Michelle Husue, um, J-O-S-U-E, and then on Facebook. And then our film, um, Matt Shepard is a friend of mine. That's on Hulu. Um, and I think on Amazon and iTunes and also on our website, which is Matt Shepard is a friend of mine dot com. Awesome. Excellent. So, yeah, guys, check out her film. Um, check out her IG. And you guys can follow us, Phil Am Creative Voices, on Instagram, Facebook, and you can follow me, Walter Towns, on Man of Tales. You can find me at Arlene underscore De La Pena. And we just want to thank you so much for coming out to Feel I'm Creative Voices. You're awesome. You're an inspiration. And they don't know it, but intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. If you talk to her, she will make you cry. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. You're awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. And... Uh, Best of luck in the future. Thank you. We're looking forward to the next one. So, so thank you for joining us. I'm Arlene Zella Pena. I'm Walter Talents, and you guys are watching Phil Am Creatives Voices. Mahalo. <laughs>